good to chat with you again. Today, I'm hoping you can cover what it's like to go on a wildfire GIS deployment. But let's start with, you know, who are you? What's your day-to-day -day role? How did you get into GIS? And, um, and what are you doing now? My name is Don Hutchinson. Um, I got a degree in forestry and, and a minor in GIS, which led me to doing GIS for local government. And um, while there, I worked with the fire department who got me involved in getting my qualifications for the incident management system. And um, so I got my GISS calls and my infrared interpretation calls. And um, now I've been working on an incident management team for over 10 years. Actually worked on several different incident management teams. Um, and I'm also working with FEMA as a um, reservist for national disasters. And I'm working with UCSD on the FIRES program, which is a um, new pilot program um, for fire intelligence, real-time fire intelligence for um, incidents. And I've been working with the JS Corps on the Fire Mappers program. Um, so I've been wearing lots of hats and <laughs> So it sounds like you, you started out in GIS, you dipped your toes in, in uh, public safety GIS, and now it's what you do full time. Yes. Um, I quit my day job a couple of years ago, and now I just do this full time. And Great. I had a very busy year last year. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Well, specific to wildland fire GIS, what, what got you involved? Like, why, why did you do it and what got you interested? Um, the guys I used to work with at the fire department got me interested and then, um, I went and got, I took my, uh, S341 class and the, um, IC classes and got a task book and started going out on incidents and just got the bug. Um, and it was, it's nice being out there working with teams and, the camaraderie and just the, it's a rewarding just being able to do what we do. Well, good. Well, good. Well, for, uh, for others that want to get involved, uh, we'll talk a little bit about pre-deployment. First of all, if you've not done anything like this before, what's the first step you think to getting involved for most people? Um, first step would be to check out some of the websites that um, are going to be posted here. Um, it, you um, will have to uh, have some GIS skills and you will have to be able to um, have an agency that sponsors you to go out on incidents and um, just be willing to uh, spend the time to um, get your qualifications, which takes a while because you have to get, get task book and work through that task book and you have to go on several incidents before a task book gets signed off. So, um, Great. And I think uh, we will definitely share the resources. Um, in the old days, I remember when I was a ranger, I had I actually started with some prerequisites and then I went down to the, the San Bernardino Training Center and took an intermediate GIS class. Uh, and is it correct that now you actually start with an online training and then you work your way to getting into a in-person class when COVID is resolved. Yes. Um, yeah, everything's online right now. Uh, the S341 class has been canceled the last couple of years due to COVID. So they're working on um, new ways to get people trained up um, and get their task books started so they can get out there and start getting trained up. Because we're always looking for more GISs. <laughs> we're All always right. need of them. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. So it sounds like you could, um, Ideally, you get onto a team and you deploy with your team. Um, for some people, they just kind of stay available and they'll get called up. But if you're on a team, how much uh, lead time do you usually get for deployment to a fire? Uh, usually a couple hours. <laughs> um, we're usually expected to be on the road um, Well, that day um, when we get our, our notification that we're going somewhere. Great. Um, so 
we have to have things ready to go and make sure our uh, house water or dog watchers on call <laughs> one text away. <laughs> These are good things to think about in advance. Um, okay, well, let's talk a little bit about what to expect. So uh, we'll start with simple stuff like uh, what what do you bring with you as far as clothing? Like what do you typically wear when you're working? Um, typically wear just jeans and a fire shirt um, if, if we're not near the fire. If we're somewhere close to the fire, we usually wear our Nomex um, and we always have to bring our PPE bags. So we have to have our um, helmets and gloves and fire shelter and our PPE with us and our boots. And so but usually we're working in a trailer or a room somewhere. So we're in our jeans and t-shirt. Very good. And um, for the instance where you do deploy and we, we know that there's lots of virtual deployments these days, uh, where do you usually stay? Are you camping? Are you at a base? Are you in a hotel? Is it all of the above? Everywhere and anywhere. <laughs> it could yeah. Be, uh, yeah. In our, um, if we're on a forest service team, it's usually camping. If we're on working with the Cal Fire team, we're using a hotel. Sometimes I bring my camper, truck and camper, and sleep in that. Um, you know, um, just all of the above. <laughs> so all of the above. Well, that probably leads into um, how long are you usually out on an incident? What's like the standard and then what's the maximum? Uh, the standard is two weeks, but um, if, if the uh, incident's going, you know, pretty good, they'll usually extend us for another week or two. And then um, we're supposed to take a day off after two weeks to reset. And if we've been out longer than that, we should just take two days off to reset. Um, but sometimes that doesn't always happen. Right. Like last right. year it was crazy. So I don't think back I back. got reset very many times. I just went from fire to fire. Well, in that case, um, there's obviously a list of things that you're supposed to take with you and your team might provide that. Um, you know, it's good to have your own water bottle and your own snacks and all that. So we don't have to go into the technical gear, but like what's something specific that you always bring that you think saves the day? Um, my seat cushion. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we get these really terrible chairs that we have to sit in all day long. And so my seat cushion is a very important part of my um, bag. <laughs> um, yeah. But then, you know, Typical laptop, um, power strips, extension cords, cable, networking stuff. Um, Got to be ready for just about anything. Um, you know, sometimes we we've been worked off of picnic benches in parks <laughs> we, with our plotter in the parking lot. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So be prepared. What yeah. about? Um, what about working hours? How many hours per day um, in general? If things are going well, how many hours per day? <laughs> typically, we work 16 hour days. Um, and typically, uh, right at the beginning of the incident, when it's first ramping up, we'll work even more than that um, for two or three days. And then once we get everything set up and running where we just have to do data updates. Um, we, it, we, it, you know, we get a little break. Okay. So it's not so intense the whole time, but um, long hours, uh, seven days a week. <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, along those lines, um, we, we won't have time today to talk about, you know, sometimes you're alone, sometimes you're part of a big team, but, um, you know, when you're on your own, obviously the, the pressure is on you. When you're on a team, maybe you can do handoffs uh, and get some power naps in. But um, really important then, like we talked about what to bring. Do they feed you usually? Like do you usually uh, have uh, food brought to you on site or do you have to like go out and hunt it yourself? Uh, no, usually um, it's pretty amazing. Um, we They set up a fire camp and it's kind of like a little city. So they bring in 
food service and laundry service and sleeping trailers and um, it showers, it, pretty much anything you need. So they feed us um, usually breakfast and dinner and then we have a sack lunch that we usually get. So we're fed, taken care of. Um, last year was a little different. We had to go out and get our own food because of COVID. So um, yeah, but we get fed. <laughs> Good stuff to know. All right, yeah. while you're working. So um, during the deployment, what's, what are the primary problems you're solving? And we joked around about before about like fixing plotters and computers, but what's the real world problem that you think uh, doing wildfire GIS contributes to the most? Um, I think uh, part of the, one of the first things I do is try and go find some local data from the local resources, um, just so I have the latest and uh, most up to date and um, and make sure we have a place that we can work out of that can meet our needs and we can bring a plotter in and we can plot stuff if needed and um, get a good Wi-Fi connection. <laughs> That's very important. Um, sometimes that takes a little while to get established. So that's one of the real problems sometimes. Um, Last year we were in Modoc County, which has a real problem with getting good Wi-Fi. So, right, right. So you have to be prepared to work offline. Speaking yeah. GIS on behalf of the team, making sure that you got local data, not just like old topo maps. Um, mm -hmm. So let's talk about not too much detail because there's a whole website for it. But um, you make maps for the field sometimes, and you make maps for the incident command post. Uh, these are primarily paper and PDF. Um, could you speak to the kind of the map products just in general, like who you're, who are some of your audiences? Who might see one of your maps? Well, um, everybody who's working out in the field, all, all the um, uh, guys on the line, um, incident commander, of course, everybody working in camp, everybody <laughs> pretty much yep. on the fire is going to see the map. Yep. Um, so we have the... Uh, Ops maps, which um, is the overall operations, and then we have public information maps and transportation maps so people can find where they're going, and progression maps so people can see how the fire has grown. And then we have lots of ArcGIS online maps now um, that we use for damage assessment and um, evacuations and public information and um, also, people uh, use collector out in the field so that we instantly get updates from the field and they can be vetted and put into the database real time. It's a, it's a good mix of online and offline and paper and web and... Um, yeah, we're trying to move away from paper more uh, and more web-based. Like, we usually make this big IAP map booklet it's uh, one to 24,000 scale, so it's 11 by 17 and several pages and takes a lot of paper and we're moving away from that finally and just going online more, so that's nice. Yeah, one of the things that uh, through this suite of presentations, you'll see Wildfire was probably the first to really establish GIS for public safety for incidents, and so they've inherited a lot of uh, legacy approaches, which is great because everybody's familiar with them, but they're also transitioning. And um, you may hear about this in other parts of Inspire or definitely in the links we send you. The National Incident Feature Service has really changed the way uh, wildfire teams share data across the country. But we can we can talk more about that later. But um, as, we, as we get closer here to you've been deployed uh, these are some of the environments you're working in. Let's talk about just after deployment. Um, what what are some things you got to take care of? The task book and, and getting paid, right? So could you speak to those? Well, um, if you're a trainee and you have a task book, you have to check in with the training officer when you get to a deployment and then um, they make you fill out a bunch of paperwork and then whoever your supervisor fills out your task book and signs off on the things you've done on that deployment. And then at the end, that all goes into the training database. And um, 
so for me, I, I um, I work for a fire department, so um, I have a Cal card through them, which I charge all my um, whatever to. Um, Time. So, yeah. Um, I just have to fill out um, my mileage if I'm driving my personal vehicle, my time card for my agency, and I also have to do what's called an FS42, which uh, has all the inf incident information on it and um, the hours I worked on the incident. And so I have to, what else? Send in all my receipts and fill out a log on what I, you know, what they're for. And, just um, send it to my agency and they take care of all that stuff. Great. Great. And obviously it'll vary by a team, but um, what, yeah. so uh, eventually is payday. How many weeks later do you think you get your reimbursement in general? Um, the agency I work for pays me every two weeks. Well, so I get paid every two weeks when I'm on instance. And um, yeah, it might be different if you're not on a team. Uh, that's uh, yeah. That's I'm working at hot, but if you yeah, it's usually you know you're working through an agency, and you usually right. it's usually how it works. But sometimes people don't get paid until the end of the season. But great. So that's something to think about for everybody that's in local government. Think about does your local fire department already get involved with uh, wildfire, and maybe there's a great opportunity to just work directly with them. Um, so that's a good good thing to note. So, okay, money is cool. It's good to get paid, but just as we close, like what, why do you go back? Cause obviously you expressed that it's hard work, but what, what do you think makes you go back each season? Like what gets you excited to do this? Um, I love the camaraderie working on a team and with all the people and it's uh, challenging and exciting and you never get bored and, um, and you there's always adrenaline because you always have this deadline you have to meet every morning, which you can't ever miss. So you got to be on top of it. And um, it's just exciting and also rewarding just, you know, to help the team and, and the guys out in the field. So they know, and, you know, everybody else in, who's monitoring all this stuff. So they know what's going on with the fire. That's great. And uh, we talked about earlier, uh, just you take a lot of skills back with you. So even if you're only going to do this once or twice a season, you learn something every time. And, and that's something oh, yeah. I hear from a lot of people. It's great. Yeah, I learn something new every time. And, you know, this, our technology is always changing. And, you know, we're moving from ArcMap to Arc Pro um, and more stuff online. So, um, it never gets boring. It's always exciting. And I guess you've got, you kind of be, got to be kind of a nerd, kind of a jazz geek. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, just uh, last thing, anything that they need to know for this season, if they want to get involved or if they've not been deployed in a while, there's just some changes coming up, right? And we can point them to the website. Yeah. Just check out the websites that are going to be posted and, um, if it's something interested you're interested in doing, uh, talk to your agency, um, talk to your um, local training officer if you have one. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, I think that is it for us. And um, we, I guess we can cut, Jared. Uh, thanks for everything. <laughs> See ya.